Good evening and welcome to SpaceX's splashdown coverage of the Polaris Dawn mission. I'm Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a Senior Manufacturing Engineering Manager here at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Tonight we are counting down to the return of our four Polaris Dawn astronauts, Jared Isaacman, Scott kidd Poteet, Sarah Gillis, and Anna Menon. The crew is wrapping up their fifth and final day on orbit in preparation for splashdown off the coast of Florida at 3.36 a.m. Eastern Time, just about an hour from now. The crew's return to Earth actually began yesterday around 4.49 a.m. Eastern Time when they initiated their first downhill phase burn, followed by the second downhill phase burn at about 6.25 a.m. Eastern. Each of these events involved short firings of Dragon's Draco thrusters to lower Dragon's altitude in advance of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Now, following these two burns, the crew finished out a day of research, calls with family, and dinner before they turned in for their last night of sleep on Dragon around 2.23 a.m. Eastern Time. And that brings us to today. Just after midnight Eastern time, the crew donned their spacesuits and made their final cabin preparations before they began the last series of operations prior to splashdown. Uh, it's been quite a trip. Uh, let's take a look at the events still ahead of us tonight. In order to return to Earth, Dragon must first separate from its trunk. <clears throat> Excuse me. The claw separation is the first step in trunk separation. Uh, it, it's basically the thing that connects the trunk to the capsule and delivers power, telemetry, and fluids. Dragon has to move to, into the proper attitude or angle in order to separate the trunk so that they don't deorbit together. And with the trunk, the trunk separated, Dragon will be running entirely on battery power. Then next up will be the deorbit burn. This will be the last time that we use the forward bulkhead thrusters located under the nose cone. And after that, we will close and lock the nose cone in preparation for reentry. Now today, the deorbit burn will last roughly seven minutes. And the deorbit burn is what will line Dragon up for reentry into Earth's atmosphere. Nitrox is used to cool the cabin and the spacesuits to keep the crew comfortable during re-entry. This is the same type of breathable gas sometimes used in scuba diving. Uh, next, we'll have nose cone closure. And that nose cone, of course, is what covers those forward hatch thrusters, which we, have, which we use in the deorbit burn, uh, and also protects the portion, that, port of the, that portion of the spacecraft during re-entry. Now, during reentry, we will have an expected loss of communication with Dragon for about seven minutes, uh, and that happens as Dragon passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. We expect to regain communication around 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time, although timing is not always exact. Now, after we regain communication with Dragon, about two minutes will pass before the drogue parachutes deploy. These are the two smaller parachutes that are designed to stabilize Dragon and slow it down before the release of the main parachutes. Less than a minute after the drogue parachutes deploy, we'll see the release of the four main parachutes. These are the big orange, white, orange and white parachutes that further slow down the spacecraft. Over the course of three minutes, the drogues and the mains will work together to bring the vehicle's velocity down from 350 miles per hour down to just about 15 miles per hour. And once it's time for our crew to deorbit and splash down back on planet Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX. All of these are located... Dragon SpaceX, deorbit sequence start in five minutes. Copy that, SpaceX, we show the same. All right, so just a call out there from uh, the core down here in uh, SpaceX Mission Control. Uh, that is the view that you're looking at now. Uh, and that was just letting the crew know that they're going to begin the deorbit burn in five minutes. It's always good to keep the crew informed of timelines so that they can expect those events. Uh, now, for recovery, all of the sites are for recovery are located off the coast of Florida, uh, basically either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading the supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize return opportunities for this mission and for future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. Now, in a wave off scenario, Dragon would remain in orbit until the next landing attempt. Since Dragon is capable of splashdown on either side of the Florida Panhandle, we have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels uh, ready 
recovery vessels ready to support, one in the Gulf of Mexico and the other in the Atlantic Ocean. SpaceX selected primary and alternate splashdown locations off the coast of Florida for for tonight's splashdown, working with a lot of different variables, including what landing sites are available and have favorable weather. Dragon has the capability to execute a unique series of orbit lowering maneuvers using its Draco thrusters to line up its ground track for each primary location and maintain the capability to change alternate sites in free flight as weather constraints dictate. At certain milestones during the mission, the SpaceX team evaluates the forecasted weather conditions at the primary and alternate splashdown sites in order to determine if they are go or no go. Uh, splashdown for that splashdown and recovery. For return, they will be looking at a number of weather items. Some of the obvious ones are no rain or no chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of not just the crew inside the capsule, but also the, wet, the recovery teams out in the water. They're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet per second or about 10 miles per hour and can relatively and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly the crew back to Florida. For these operations, SpaceX closely coordinates with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safety zone to ensure public safety and for safety of those involved in the recovery operations, as well as the crew on board the returning spacecraft. Multiple notices are issued to mariners in advance and during recovery operations, and Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. Now, we want to stress to the public the need to respect the safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation. Any other boats interfering increases risk to the astronauts in the capsule, the teams working to recover them from the water, and the safety of those that come too close. So for the safety of the crew and your safety, we recommend you sit back and watch as we'll be bringing you the best possible views of our astronauts coming home right here. In the next phase of the mission, Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning our crew home. First, Dragon will jettison its trunk, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the spacecraft. The trunk is currently connected to the aft or bottom section of the Dragon capsule where the heat shield is located. So in order to expose that heat shield and get the vehicle ready for atmospheric entry, we'll jettison the trunk. From there, the spacecraft will use its forward thrusters to perform a deorbit burn, which will put Dragon on a trajectory to return to Earth and our splashdown location at Dry Tortugas off the Florida Keys. This, will burn, this burn will last about seven minutes once it starts. And to prepare for these upcoming events... Dragon SpaceX, we do have a Tedris handover around Clawsep and Trunksep, so I'll make sure to formalize all calls after the Tedris handover. This is not about... Five minutes. Yeah, I copy that SpaceX, we're tracking. And just some comms there from the ground to the crew to let them know that during the Tedris handover, we will lose some communication. So they're just uh, informing them ahead of time and they'll make sure that they'll uh, communicate the comms um, after they gain communications back with the crew. So to prepare for these upcoming events, right now the Dragon capsule is doing a couple of things autonomously. One of these steps includes isolating the thermal control system fluid loops from the radiator. This system is what will help keep the internal temperature of Dragon temperate for... The orbit sequence start. SpaceX, we shall see. Great news, the deorbit sequence has begun. Again, this system is what will keep the internal, temp the internal temperature of Dragon temperate for the crew during reentry. Dragon is also initiating separation of the claw mechanism, which will terminate data, power, and fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. So that's a pretty exciting milestone. Basically, we have the trunk attached to Dragon for the duration of the mission that provides power to the Dragon capsule and the crew. Um, but once it's separated, now they're, they're going to be ready to come back home, back down to Earth.
Yeah, and all of these kind of, while they are choreographed and spaced out, they happen quite quickly. So I'm sure that the crew on board Dragon, you know, they've been in orbit for five days now. Uh, it's going to go by in a blink of an eye for them, <laughs> most likely, and they'll be back here on planet Earth. Um, now, some uh, information about Dragon for those who have not tuned into our Dragon missions previously. Um, from the beginning, SpaceX designed the spacecraft for human spaceflight. Uh, while it can carry up to seven passengers, right now it's only carrying four. Um, and it is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. In fact, this exact capsule that our Polaris Dawn crew is flying in first went to, uh, or its first mission was the Crew-1 mission, uh, and it went to the International Space Station. Oh, and look, our first views of the crew uh, this morning inside Dragon Resilience. Um, on your far left side of the screen is mission specialist uh, Anna uh, Menon. She is also the medical officer on board for this mission. Uh, to her left, or our right, is our pilot Scott Kid Potit. To the right of Kid is Jared Isaacman. He's the commander of the Polaris Dawn mission. And on the far right side at the other window seat is other mission specialist, Sarah Gillis. Uh, both Anna and Sarah are our SpaceX coworkers, and it's been such a joy to watch them experience spaceflight um, through their eyes as uh, SpaceX employees who in their uh, day job have helped train other astronauts for their human spaceflight missions. And so it's just so incredible to see Sarah and Anna now having their own uh, spaceflight. <laughs> yeah, I still can't believe it. You know, we got to see and talk to them this morning, um, and it was just so cool to see our SpaceXers on the other side floating in space. <laughs> and I love the space hair. That was probably yeah. my favorite part. <laughs> oh, of course. Um, so we are anticipating uh, our Polaris Dawn crew to return and splash down um, about 12.36 a.m. Pacific time, or 3.36 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and they are splashing down off the coast of Florida. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to getting them home. Uh, I ha have ordered a copy of Anna's book and I will definitely be asking her to sign it when she gets back. <laughs> oh, I definitely ordered one as well. Dragon SpaceX nominal trunk jettison. Copy that SpaceX, we share the same and felt the same. All right, good news there. Uh, we just heard that the trunk has uh, been jettisoned or separated, uh, which is great news. Uh, like we were saying before, we had to basically uh, unconnect with the trunk in order to expose the heat shield, which is the, um, the, the, the most important thing when it comes to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and we're doing that trunk separation now so that the trunk and the capsule don't return together in um, the same trajectory. So uh, good news there that the trunk is now jettisoned. Yeah, exactly. So that means that telemetry is looking good. The nitrox system is primed for cabin and suit cooling. And again, the heat shield is exposed and ready for atmospheric reentry. Now, Dragon will slew, or what we call maneuver, itself into the correct position to deorbit, uh, to do the deorbit burn here in just a few minutes. Now, for the deorbit burn, this is the last time that the forward Dracos, which are the four thrusters located on top of the vehicle, will ignite. The deorbit burn will place Dragon on a precise trajectory to return to the splashdown zone off Dry Tortugas in the Florida Keys and will last about seven minutes long. Dry Tortugas is a new landing location for Dragon that our teams activated in a couple weeks uh, just prior to the Polaris Dawn mission's launch earlier. Uh, this is the first time that we will be returning Dragon to the Dry Tortuga Splashdown site, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> I was personally very excited to hear this because I did a uh, presentation about uh, Dry Tortugas National Park when I was in middle school. So oh, wow. um, I knew exactly where they were going when I heard the name. <laughs> Full circle moment there. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so we were talking a little bit about the different burns that the Dragon capsule does in, orbit, in order to uh, deorbit and return to Earth safely. Um, there are 16 Draco thrusters used to orient the spacecraft throughout the mission, including apogee and perigee maneuvers, um, as well as orbit adjustments and attitude control. 
For the deorbit burn, uh, that only fires four of the Draco thrusters on the perimeter of the nose cone, uh, basically located around the Skywalker that we saw in action during the EVA. Um, and it was incredible to see that, but it's those four Draco thrusters that we saw there um, that are basically going to be doing all of the work for this deorbit burn. Uh, each Draco thruster is capable of generating 90 pounds of force in the vacuum of space. Uh, and it's pretty cool uh, to, to see them in action. We actually saw some video captured while they were doing some orbital adjustments uh, earlier in the week posted to X that I just thought were so cool because you, you also got to see some earthly lights uh, from the ground in the background as well. Oh yeah, the views from this mission were incredible. We got to see a lot of things that we've never seen before, especially with the the um, Skywalker at the top of Dragon. Um, that's the same location as where those four Draco thrusters are, but just a new mobility aid that they were able to use during the spacewalk. Just a lot of cool firsts on this mission this week. Indeed. It has <laughs> been a long week, that is for sure. <laughs> it seems like every day there was action uh, oh, yeah. happening, and we're super excited that um, they're going to be coming back soon and share more of their experience with us when they're on the ground. Um, once again, this view is looking inside of Dragon Resilience. It is making its, <coughs> excuse me, making its way back to Earth. Um, it, we can see some minor movements there with the straps. Uh, and uh, Still floating around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they're, um, they're making their, their way back to Earth. Again, they are going to be splashing down off the coast of Florida. We anticipate that splashdown around uh, 3.36 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, there are a couple of events that are uh, still coming up. Um, we're going to close the nose cone. Um, that will help protect the forward hatch during re-entry um, and it also means that we will not be using the forward, uh, forward bulkhead Draco thrusters any longer. Um, basically, this deorbit burn is the last time that um, those will be utilized. Yeah, and we are expecting that deorbit burn any minute now. Um, and again, that's going to help put Dragon on the trajectory towards the splashdown zone. <laughs> And again, as a reminder, they are still currently in space in orbit um, and have not re-entered the Earth's atmosphere just yet. That's what this deorbit burn is going to help them uh, adjust to that trajectory. And then they will perform the entry burn or entry of Dragon back into Earth's atmosphere. Clearly, Anna <laughs> is savoring the last few minutes of her <laughs> microgravity experience. And that uh, deorbit burn is in progress. Uh, it's about a seven minute burn. Once again, this helps to put the Dragon capsule uh, into the correct, uh, in, in, into the correct uh, trajectory uh, for its landing. This deorbit burn is the last time that we use those four forward Draco thrusters uh, for this mission. And again, Dragon has not entered Earth's atmosphere just yet. This deorbit burn is what lines the vehicle up and puts it on its final trajectory to the landing site near Dry Tortugas off the Florida Keys. Now, right now, the crew are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration, Draco thruster firings, and trajectory details like entry angle, capsule perigee, velocity, and how much time remains until the deorbit, deorbit burn termination. And that's uh, because they, they want to monitor this because they're they are going to hear a lot of different sounds with the burns going on. So Dragon is currently flying free itself. And so all the crew has to do is stay strapped into their seats and keep an eye on things. And there you can see the screen and some cool new uh, <laughs> stickers there. <laughs> Great Scott. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love to see how they uh, <laughs> add their own personality, like just right there in the middle that 1.21 gigawatts, obviously referring to Back to the Future. Um, it is it is worth noting that uh, drag, er, excuse me, that Jared has actually flown in this capsule in the commander seat 
once before as he was the commander of the Inspiration4 mission. Uh, just a quick note here, these are those Draco thrusters at the forward bulkhead, as well as the Skywalker mobility aid that we saw tested out during the extravehicular activity or EVA. It seems almost <laughs> sad and heartbreaking to not see, you know, a person hanging out there. Uh, those views were just so incredible that seeing a, an empty, <laughs> empty forward hatch just, you know, we'll, we'll come back. Yeah. We'll come back. We'll do it again. Um, but what an incredible spacewalk we had earlier this week and just some cool views that we had there um, from the nose cone looking uh, back down on Earth. And again, as we mentioned, the crew is using their displays just to monitor. Dragon is fully autonomous, um, so it's it's doing all these maneuvers uh, on its own. Um, and the crew's just, you know, watching, monitoring, making sure they, they know when uh, the burn uh, is going and when it's going to conclude and how much time is left. Um, and we do just have a few more minutes. Again, this deorbit burn, they're currently in the deorbit burn and this burn should last just about uh, seven minutes and we're about halfway through at this point. I love this view here. Um, because, so just for a little bit of frame of reference, on the left side of the screen is Commander Jared Isaacman, and the right-hand side of the screen is pilot Scott Poteet, although he prefers to go by his call sign KID. Uh, and I think that this is such a great view because it, it, it really gives you an idea of what they are looking at in addition to the tablets that they have strapped onto their legs. You can see the procedures that they are following along with as well as the, the display that illustrates which Dracos are firing at what point. Now this deorbit burn is still underway. Uh, I'm going to pull up the map real quick, but it looks like that might be Australia. Yeah, according to our dragon tracker, that is the west coast of Australia. It's so cool almost to see the difference. Uh, if you watched, you know, earlier this week, they made it over 1,400 kilometers away from Earth. They got a nice round view of the globe. Um, and now you can see that they're much closer to Earth um, with just a, a very s small slice of, slice of Earth that they could see in that view. We can see the straps still floating. <laughs> now, if you're uh, curious as to where Dragon is, you can, of course, follow Dragon yourself. We have it on our website, spacex.com slash follow dash Dragon. And it shows you exactly where uh, Dragon is along its path. Oh, and there's both. <laughs> And you can see how fast they will move as they will be splashing down off the coast of Florida. Um, and they're just passing by Australia right now. Um, we do expect splashdown um, to happen in about 30 minutes or so. Now that's a nice way to travel really fast. So I'd like to take one of these next time I go on an international flight. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and just such great clear views. This is, this is a, a nice treat for us to be able to see this. And we do have just about a minute remaining in this burn. Again, this will be the last burn for these Draco thrusters uh, at the forward bulkhead. And once this is complete, then we can close the nose, nose cone. Um, we do close the nose cone in preparation for re-entry. Um, that helps uh, allow us to reuse the capsule, makes reusable a lot easier when you can open and close the nose cone. Uh, previous uh, Dragon designs, we did jettison the nose cone. Now we keep it attached, so in preparation for entry, we do close and lock that nose cone.
For those that have just recently tuned in, we have successfully separated the trunk from the Dragon Capsule. Uh, and the, uh, these are just such amazing views. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX, deorbit burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure initiated. We show the same and tracking. Confirmation there that we had a successful and nominal deorbit burn. So we're now going to see the nose cone begin its closing uh, process. It takes a couple minutes for this to fully complete as the, I think we can see some shadows moving here, which means that we're, we're about to lose this gorgeous view. <laughs> <laughs> this is an incredible view. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, the vehicle is doing a slew, so it is maneuvering um, to orient that heat shield a little bit more towards the earth, uh, and that helps prepare us for reentry. Yeah. And we can see that nose cone coming into view now there in the top left corner. Once it is all the way down, um, there will be some hooks that lock in to make sure that it is locked up, as Jesse had said earlier. Once again, we will not be using the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters anymore. Honestly, this view is just so cool to see everything that's happening. You can still see Earth, you've got Dragon maneuvering, you've got the nose cone closing, and you get to see the Skywalker mobility aid all in one. <laughs> You can see that nose cone coming down to its final position ever so slowly and ever so sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and steady. Uh. And again, we close the nose cone in preparation for re-entry of the vehicle. This helps keep the nose cone safe intact with the vehicle. Um, again, we are going to close this and lock this. Uh, and this protects the top part of the vehicle as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Now we don't necessarily need it for Dragon, but we do want to protect that Skywalker uh, during re-entry, which we don't typically have or haven't had before on Dragon missions. Um, so this nose cone will actually keep that Skywalker mobility aid pretty safe as well. Indeed. Now, while all this has been going on, the vehicle has initiated the Nitrox suit purge. This helps to keep our crew members cool and comfortable during re-entry which once again, we expect that to occur uh, here in a few minutes, in about a half hour, or a little bit less than a half hour. The exterior of the vehicle will reach temperatures of about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And the crew members remain comfortable, really, uh, even though the outside is quite extreme. Um, thanks to the environmental systems inside the Dragon capsule and the thermal protection system on the exterior of the capsule. Yeah, it's pretty important to, to keep them cool on the inside. Again, we don't have the trunk of Dragon anymore, so it is on internal power, but it's enough uh, power to keep everything cool inside the cabin because as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, it can get up to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've heard some of the, the crew members that have flown on Dragon that sometimes they can even see some of the sparks through the window. Mm -hmm. um, the plasma. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so all along for the basically the last day, um, the, the Dragon capsule has been decreasing its altitude, beginning with the first two phasing burns that occurred on Friday. Um, 100 kilometers in altitude uh, will begin entry interface. And at that point, that's when the crew begin to feel the effects um, of the Earth's atmosphere. I just love these stickers here. It's so great. <laughs> 
And again, the crew is just monitoring. They also have their tablets, they have the displays. Um, they can follow along with all the procedures that are happening um, every single step of the way. Uh, with everything that's happening with the burns, with the nose cone uh, closing inside of Dragon, they'll be able to hear some different sounds. So being able to follow along with the procedures is really important so that they can uh, connect the dots with the sound to the action that is happening outside of the capsule. At this point in time, we're just standing by to hear confirmation of the nose cone's closure. Once we get that information, that basically completes the first half of our deorbit process. Once again, these views live from inside Dragon Resilience, looking over the shoulders of our commander and pilot, Jared Isaacman and Kid Poteet. And currently they are traveling 17,500 miles per hour while they are still in orbit, uh, but they will go down to about 350 miles per hour once the drogues deploy. Um, and then the mains, the main chutes are actually going to slow the vehicle down so much that by the time that they splash down back on Earth, it's only about 15 miles per hour that they'll be going. So um, those drogue chutes and main chutes uh, are pretty important and do a very good job of slowing the vehicle down. Yeah, we uh, actually now build our drogue parachutes in-house. Uh, shout out to the Bloomfield team up in Connecticut. Uh, these drogue parachutes uh, do quite a bit of work. And actually, if we didn't have drogue parachutes, we would have to have uh, more main parachutes and they would have to be twice as big in order to effectively slow the capsule down. Um, Basically, the drogue parachutes deploy around 18,000 feet when the vehicle is going three, about 350 miles per hour. And the vehicle, thanks to the drogues and the heat shield uh, and really just you know, the continued friction of the Earth's atmosphere, um, helps slow it down to 119 miles per hour when the mains deploy at about uh, 6,500 feet. So it, they're... Um, really important pieces <laughs> of the Dragon capsule, and it's always so uh, fun to watch them deploy. I can only imagine what it would feel like uh, <laughs> to be in the capsule as you you're, you're starting to, to to feel Earth again, uh, <laughs> and then these these things pop out and really slow you down. I'm sure it's uh, a welcome feeling, but also kind of a sad one because it means they're you know they're really at the very end of their of their space flight. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it's probably somewhat similar to skydiving, but except they're coming from microgravity yeah. <laughs> into gravity. SpaceX, nose cone secure for entry. Copy that, SpaceX. All right, so there we heard it. The nose cone is confirmed to be completely closed, and that is great news as we begin the second half of entry. Right now, Dragon is beginning to flush nitrox into the cabin and continuing to top off the crew's suits with that cool air. Again, this is what will allow the cabin temperature to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat shield is pointing forward, leading the capsule to the landing site. Now, while we wait, let's talk a little bit about some of the highlights from the week. On September 11th, the crew hosted a book reading of Anna's book, Kisses from Space. The book details a Mama Dragon's trip to space and the inspiration she draws from her two kids and husband on Earth. After her book reading, Anna and the entire Polaris Dawn crew held a Q&A with St. Jude patients to answer their questions about space. On that same day, orbiting Earth onboard Dragon, the Polaris Dawn crew talked with families and representatives of Folds of Honor, an organization providing educational scholarships to spouses and children of America's fallen and disabled military service members and first responders. And just yesterday, the crew connected with Air Force cadets who helped train them for a week of solo diving, excuse me, solo skydiving at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado. Yeah, and it's been a pretty jam-packed week, and those were just a couple of events that they, you know, did while they were on orbit. But there's been so many um, experiments, so many records that they've been able to break. They 
hit the highest apogee since the Gemini 11 mission almost 50 years ago. Uh, they performed the first ever commercial EVA spacewalk. They flew and utilized our newly designed EVA spacesuits, which we designed in-house here at SpaceX. So just a lot of exciting stuff, such a great mission. Um, pretty jam-packed in to get all of that in in just five days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure they're probably having a good time being able to relax right now as they come back down to Earth. Yeah, it has <laughs> been an incredible week. And while in orbit, the Polaris Dawn crew hosted the first ever Space to Earth music moment. <laughs> uh, fellow SpaceX engineer and musician Sarah Gillis performed on a custom violin the primary melody of Ray's theme from Star Wars The Force Awakens, which of course was composed by the legendary John Williams. Sarah was joined by youth mu musicians from around the world, all students in the International El Sistema program excuse me, program. Starlink satellites beamed Sarah's performance from Dragon down to Earth, and here's how it turned out. Three, two, one. Welcome aboard the Dragon spacecraft. I'm Sarah Gillis, one of the Polaris Dawn crew members. As we travel around our beautiful planet Earth on this five-day mission, we wanted to share this special music moment with you. Bringing together global talent, this performance symbolizes unity and hope, highlighting the resilience and potential of children everywhere. Here is Ray's theme by John Williams, brought to you from the stars. Thank you. 
Wow. I have watched that so many times. <laughs> Literally watched, listened. I have a background in music. So watching this and seeing, you know, how music connects people all around the world and the fact that that is exactly what Sarah did with her violin yeah. is connect multiple locations around the world, brought them all together. Orchestras. This is an amazing symphony. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> seeing her do her thing in space is incredible. And the fact that um, she pulled on her existing music experience, many of us here um, are musicians, you know, it makes us better engineers. At least that's what I always thought about my uh, music uh, education. And it's just so cool to Sarah bring that to such a um, a, a massive platform and in such a cool way. <laughs> yeah, like uh, so impressed. I literally, yeah. I was speechless when I first watched it, but I think I've watched it like six times by now. <laughs> For sure. Um, so right now, uh, we don't have views inside the cabin at the moment, but the crew, they continue their deorbit journey. Um, as of right now, we have already separated the trunk from the Dragon capsule, and that allows us, and they've uh, undergone the deorbit burn as well. Um, and separating that Dragon trunk allows us to expose the heat shield. And so let's talk a little bit about the heat shield in, in greater detail. Um, Dragon's primary heat shield is composed of PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. The first gen PICA was actually developed by NASA for studying and sampling comets within our solar system. SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop PICA-X, which was the second generation product used on all Dragon 1 CRS missions that successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions. PICA 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down cost and mass. Yeah. The remainder of the Dragon capsule is composed primarily of uh, a SpaceX proprietary ablative material, uh, or SPAM. <laughs> it's another class of thermal protection which is lighter weight than PICA and protects the underlying composite structure during re-entry to ensure the structural capabilities are maintained. Yeah, while Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak re-entry conditions, the characteristics of the thermal protection systems coupled with the environmental cooling and life support system in the pressurized interior will ensure that the crew will stay cool and comfortable during all phases of re-entry through splashdown because it does get very hot on the outside. Now, we caught up with the Inspiration4 crew on what they were thinking and feeling about this during their mission. Coming back home is dynamic. It is exciting because you hit the atmosphere like a bullet. You're traveling 17,500 miles per hour or Mach 25. And then um, when you hit the atmosphere, the capsule starts slowing down. And as a result, you get this G load that comes on you quickly and then it's sustained. And, and at the same time, the dragon's making these giant S turns, um, which is again, dialing into its location, but also slowing down the capsule. And, and for me, I was just sitting there like, this is fantastic, you know? That's what was going through my mind. Yeah, and there's that rhythmic pulse of the Draco engines that are steering you and orienting the Dragon capsule in the right direction. And that's all you hear until the parachutes deploy. You see, you see the light change through the windows because it is making those S-turns. And you don't hear the wind go by until you get to about 50 kilometers up, and that's when you start to hear the rush of the wind, even though you start to feel those Gs pretty early. And uh, what's really cool about it is that as soon as you hear that pop of the, the pyros putting the drone drogue shoots out, the Dracos go silent. And that is an eerie but calm feeling. Uh, do you remember feeling that when the parachutes deployed, all of a sudden the Dracos just shut off and now we're just... Hey there. Not until you mentioned that. Yeah. I'm but glad you remember that. I know, but I just remember the feeling of relief of oh, being yeah. like, yes, <laughs> the drugs fired and then the, you know, and then the mains because Jared had his hands on the buttons in case just there was case. something, that, you know, we needed it. And that's, it's a, it's a dynamic, interesting time of reentry. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I was nervous for re-entry. <laughs> okay. Just, you know, launch, I just, you're so excited. Cause you know, eight, nine minutes, I'm gonna be in space. But then re-entry was, it was more intimidating for me. And, um, and then it was also just, 
it was more dynamic. It was more intense physically after you'd had no days of zero gravity and then you started experiencing the like G's again and then you're up to four and a half G's. It's really intense. You're just trying to breathe. And um, and when the parachutes come out, it sounds like explosions. It is. The pyros go poof. Yeah. And then you're waiting and... I, but it's and such a relief. You're really happy is. to hear those explosions. <laughs> you really are. Yeah. And, um, and I just remember when we started entering the atmosphere, I could see like fire from the window. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was cool. But um, but whenever we, we hit the water, it was just it was just intense relief. I think mm-hmm. one of my favorite moments though is right before you know we're all strapped in and we're working our way to our descent, and then that's when Jarrett was like, "Well, I want to give you guys something to look forward to. So let me tell you about our splashdown party once yeah. we get back." Because <laughs> he kept it a secret. He kept it a secret, and then you, and I, I kept thinking, "You're telling us now as we're going into the most like dynamic part of flight." But he just that's Jarrett. He's like, "Let's calm down. It's all good, and and let's uh, share some exciting news to look forward to." Mm-hmm. Some awesome words there from the Inspiration4 crew. I should say the Inspiration4 crew that isn't currently on board the right. uh, Polaris <laughs> Dawn uh, capsule. So Jared also commanded the Inspiration4 crew um, as well as our current Polaris Dawn mission. And in fact, this capsule is the same one that the Inspiration4 crew flew in as well. So that we, we heard it from the experts. Uh, re-entry is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool to hear, you know, their different, each one had a different insight. Uh, Haley was, you know, this was the more dynamic portion that she was maybe a little bit more worried about. And Chris talking about how, like, the Draco engines go silent. Yeah. Just love hearing uh, the thoughts uh, from that experience. Yeah. Now, very similar to the Inspiration4 crew, the Polaris Dawn crew did a ton of research while they were on orbit. Um, uh, so many, so many science and research per, uh, performed. Uh, about 36 research studies and experiments from 31 partner institutions designed to advance both human health here on Earth during, uh, as well as in space during long duration spaceflight. Um, there is a, a great opportunity for these individuals to um, really bring another element of research to. Uh, issues and, and health concerns that we have here on Earth, and, and that's pretty great. <laughs> we have had a full complement of research, an action-packed schedule for this mission. We've had a, about 40 science and research experiments that we have been tackling, and they span all sorts of genres, and we're really excited to talk to you about a few of them today. So right here, what you see, this is a butterfly ultrasound device. And it's really neat because it can work with like an iPhone or an iPad or just any sort of like tablet device. And so it's really portable and you can take it anywhere, even to space. So we've been using it for all a whole bunch of different experiments, measuring um, our different veins. We've been measuring our bladder. We've been measuring um, our like kidneys and liver and a lot of different pieces of the body. So it's been really interesting and we're excited to le- see what we learn from all the data. This was created by the U.S. Air Force Academy, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I was assigned there many moons ago as one of the uh, commanders of the cadets. And uh, what uh, these cadets have created is a casing that holds uh, different plants. And we've been imaging these plants on a daily basis to see what the impact of uh, zero gravity is uh, on, this, uh, on this plant. One of the big concerns is the, the fluid shift up here at zero gravity. We can really feel the effect as soon as we were on orbit. And you can kind of see it in our faces. Um, so one of the concerns with long duration space flight is to be able to triage in case of an emergency. And uh, one of the first uh, basic steps is airway assessment. Um, and so we volunteered to uh, uh, do some imaging of our airway. We did it, uh, this experiment before flight, during flight, and then we'll do it post-flight. And what this requires is us to uh, numb up the nasal, pa- nasal passage um, and then insert this endoscopic camera all the way through the nasal passage and, and, and back of the throat to take these different images. Um, and then post-flight, we'll be able to assess uh, what what uh, happened to the airway passage uh, as that fluid shifts. This is a Tempest Pro, uh, also uh, called our uh, ambulance in a box. 
So, uh, you know, if you believe in uh, SpaceX's vision of making life multiplanetary, that we're going to have thousands of starships in space someday, tens of thousands of people, we're on Mars and we're exploring our solar system, it's pretty cool. But those are some pretty long journeys, and, uh, and hospitals aren't very close by. So we have to be able to bring diagnostic tools uh, into space with us and then be able to beam that information back home to the flight surgeons. So just yesterday, we hooked up uh, all sorts of cables to this, so blood pressure, SpO2, respiration, uh, EKG leads, and basically we're able to capture a number of vital signs um, and, uh, and test it out. And then today, we actually did a full-blown medical simulation of what, what could be a very likely uh, medical uh, you know, situation that could develop after an EVA, and then was able to beam a lot of this information home via Starlink to the flight surgeons in mission control. So I really am excited about it because it's this kind of technology that's going to be needed you know, to kind of further humankind's ambitions to uh, explore among the stars. We've been collecting data kind of every day, looking at the changes in our vision over time and space. We also have an experiment from CU Boulder that we uh, did shortly after arriving on orbit, where you actually put a contact lens into your eye to ch monitor the pressure change over time. And there's a picture of Jared. He has the contact lens in his eye that's sending pressure data over 24, 12, 24 hours to a sensor, um, but he really looked like a rogue space pirate with his eye patch kind of covering it so he didn't have to have some vision changes from that lens, but it was, a, it was quite a look up here for the space pirate. <laughs> So cool to see them talk about their different science, science experiments. And uh, if you noticed, they were like letting go of some of the stuff that they were holding. It's just <laughs> floating there. Chaos. Uh, <laughs> but in addition to their science experiments and research experiments that they did on September 12th, while traveling in a 184 by 732 kilometer orbit around the Earth, the crew performed the first ever commercial spacewalk. Extravehicular activities or EVAs are activities performed by space-suited astronauts outside of their spacecraft in orbit of the Earth. They are generally performed for service, maintenance, repair, or replacement of space equipment. Yeah, it was so incredible to <laughs> see this live uh, and see them going through and, and testing, going through their test matrix for uh, the suits. Uh, now, an extravehicular activity usually begins with depressurization of the airlock or space module and then ends with repressurization of that space module or airlock after crew member ingress. But because Crew Dragon doesn't have an airlock, the entire cabin was actually depressurized and all four astronauts on board participated in the spacewalk. Um, it was Sarah. SpaceX, Dragon, our tablets are secure, restraints are tightened, and our visors are down. SpaceX copies for crew entry prep. All right, good news there. Uh, that was Jared letting us know that uh, their tablets are secured and the visors are down, which then creates that complete uh, um, uh, system for the spacesuit uh, for them to basically be ready for the more dynamic parts of the reentry phase, um, which is coming up soon. We are um, about seven minutes away from the anticipated loss of signal. Um, but getting back to the incredible spacewalk uh, that Sarah and Jared um, and Kid and Anna uh, performed. It was actually Sarah and Jared that took turns actually exiting the spacecraft while Kid and Anna supported from the inside. Uh, overall, the spacewalk lasted one hour and 46 minutes from the time that the cabin air was vented to when it was repressurized once again. So it was incredible and um, uh, the first commercial spacewalk is certainly a moment to remember. Um, so now some Dragon facts uh, in terms of the Dragon capsule overall. Like I said earlier, uh, it's designed from the beginning uh, to enable human spaceflight, even though we started just with cargo <laughs> spaceflight. It can carry up to seven passengers, but for today, we've got four crew members on board, and it is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. It's also the first private spacecraft to take an all-civilian crew to orbit, uh, and that was this exact Dragon capsule, Dragon Resilience, that, of course, was the inspiration for mission. This Dragon mission, uh, this Polaris Dawn track Dragon mission flew further than any Dragon to date and reached the highest 
Earth orbit ever flown with an apogee of 1,408.1 kilometers. Dragon has performed 47 total launches, including Polaris Dawn, 14 crew missions, including Polaris, uh, five of those being private astronaut missions and nine being NASA missions. There were four, we've had 42 visits to the International Space Station, 25 missions utilizing a reflown or a refurbished Dragon capsule, including Polaris Dawn. And like we mentioned earlier, this is the exact same Dragon flown on the Inspiration4 mission. Dragon SpaceX, five minutes until predicted calm blackout. See you on the other side. Copy that, SpaceX. We're tracking the same. Talk to you soon. And we just heard some comms from the core to the crew, letting them know we're just about five minutes away from that blackout period, um, which is very, very exciting. That means that the crew is almost going to get through the portion of passing through the atmosphere, um, re-entering the atmosphere, coming back down to Earth. Um, and ironically, today is actually the three-year anniversary, three years ago today, uh, on September 15th, 2021, uh, the Inspiration4 mission actually launched. Uh, and so we got to hear some thoughts. We don't get to hear the Player Stone crew. They haven't gone through this re-entry period. So we got to hear some thoughts from the Inspiration4 crew on their thoughts of this re-entry period. It's now time to come home. We've been floating in space for three days. What did it feel like to you guys to all of a sudden experience a tenth of a G as we came back? Okay, you said that <laughs> liftoff was your favorite part. Coming back was actually mine. I loved hitting the atmosphere and the dynamics of it and having the, the G load, you know, come yeah. on quick and you're like, okay, yeah. you know, gravity's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you were, I, know I much preferred <laughs> launch um, <laughs> over splashdown. But yeah, I, um, cause you know, we were in space for three days and this is something I didn't think about um, beforehand, but whenever we started entering the atmosphere and started feeling the gravity again, I remember saying out loud, Oh my gosh, this is so intense. How many Gs are we at? And Jared said 0 0.3. I know. So we were at a third of Earth gravity. And I was like, how oh, are we gonna get to four and a half? But you just you just get through it. Yeah. Just keep breathing, right? And then you just you just pray the parachutes will open. And oh. then whenever they do, and then you hear from SpaceX, four healthy mains, I remember screaming, Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the most intense, you know, when they talk about the dragon being autonomous and stuff, um, you know, on ascend going up. Up, if the launch escape system will probably catch an error before Jared and I could react. Right. You know, we could do stuff, but you've got that. But coming back, you um, can't abort coming back. You, you can't. Can't, come back. you can't. You can't. You know, and but the most intense moment I think for the commander and the pilot is making sure that the drogues and the mains come out because we have a short window where we can manually fire them if right. they don't. And and I just remember, you know, we're counting down, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm like green, yellow, and if I gotten to red, then that wouldn't have been good. Mm -hmm. um, but every time green happened, the pyros went and Jared and I were just like, oh, there's the drogues. And then, and we could see it on our monitor. I don't know if you could, but we're like, oh yes, drogues. And then no, we I go had through. I to rip off my iPad to hand it to you so you could oh, take, yeah, a can picture take a picture once we got the screen. Off, yeah. yeah, because once we got off the four healthy mains, Jared was like, that's the best thing I've ever seen. And I was like, yes. Yeah, and then it was like, at that point it was so peaceful because because re-entry was very dynamic. It was oh, the yeah. G-forces were so intense. It was more shaky than launch mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. And then when the parachutes deploy, that <laughs> they lift you they up do. and mm -hmm. um, shake you all around. And then whenever, after they're out, then you're just kind of falling down. I remember it sounded like a summer breeze outside. <laughs> and we were like in one G and uh, just drifting down. And then when we hit the water, nice. we knew it. It was. Oh. Well, that was one thing too. When you said you're looking at the screens, you and I had a pretty good view, Haley, of sweet. We could actually look out the windows at that point. And I remember seeing that the Dragon capsule reorient and as it's making those S curves to the atmosphere and seeing the clouds move very dynamically. See, I'd love yeah. that. That to me, hearing the Dracos firing and the, you know, it's like 
as we're doing these giant S curves. That's exactly what and, it sounded like. Yeah, <laughs> it's like ingrained in my memory. And I'm like, and I remember just being there and being like, this is so cool, yeah. you know? And just the technology of what SpaceX has done and being able to, you know, have a, a capsule that will dial itself in and, and slow down your descent. Uh, it's just amazing. Such yeah. a great experience. But Splashdown was awesome because when we hit the water, you're just like, we did it. It was a very emotional moment, yeah. more than I expected. I love what <laughs> Dr. Proctor said there. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love, I literally love seeing all the reactions because, you know, we don't get to, you know, experience these events with them. Um, and every single one is very unique to each person's experience. And I love that all three of them have just like a different view of how each event went. <laughs> yeah. That it's, um, it's so great to be able to hear their reactions. Uh, and I look forward to hearing the Polaris Dawn Cruise reactions uh, when once they get back on Earth and share their experience with us. Uh, now, the Polaris Dawn crew, we are coming up to our anticipated loss of signal. Um, this is the point in time in which the amount of plasma building up on the exterior of the vehicle becomes significant and that we are unable to um, command the vehicle or receive telemetry uh, or communicate with the crew. So this happens every time a Dragon capsule comes back through the Earth's atmosphere. And we're anticipating about a seven minute uh, loss of signal for, for today's re-entry. Um, but it's um, a period in which we, a couple minutes before it ends, we'll hear the core call out, uh, the core being the crew opera operations and resources engineer. Uh, and that person is the voice to the crew, and they're sitting right there in that room on your screen. That is Mission Control here at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Uh, and a couple minutes before the uh, blackout period ends, we'll, we'll start to hear the core uh, hail the Dragon capsule because sometimes they get through it quicker and we're able to communicate uh, earlier than anticipated. So yeah, it's an expected period where basically no vehicle telemetry is received um, by Mission Control or the recovery team uh, and we're unable to command the vehicle. So um, as, as a reminder though, the Dragon capsule is programmed to and designed to fly itself so uh, as we heard from the Inspiration4 crew earlier, uh, it is a period of great anticipation, but coming out on the other side is a, is a moment of um, a lot of joy. <laughs> Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, we are expected to be in the blackout period at this moment. We did hear the call, the core call that out about five minutes ago. Um, so we should be in that blackout period. Again, it should last about six, seven minutes. Um, and what's expected to come next is going to be, once we get through that blackout period, we will confirm we have a uh, comms with the crew once again, um, and then we will be expecting the drogue parachutes to deploy. Again, that helps slow the vehicle down. They've been flying very fast in space at 17,500 miles per hour. Those drogues are going to slow down the vehicle to about 350 miles per hour, and then the four main parachutes will deploy and slow the vehicle down as it's making its way back down to Earth and should touch down at you know, around 15, 16 miles per hour. So these chutes are very, very important to help keep the vehicle slowly um, moving towards the earth, scrubbing that velocity uh, as they've been moving very quickly, um, but they should have a very light touchdown back on earth uh, in the ocean. Uh, you can hear a, bit, a little bit of a crowd here <laughs> forming outside of Mission Control. You can see there on your screen as uh, some of our fellow employees are gathering in anticipation of the splashdown. It's always one of the best, not one of, the best place to stand um, for these types of events, although it is uh, pretty late on a Saturday night, so uh, <laughs> perhaps not the normal size crowd. <laughs> this is a, you know, this is a pretty good event for a Saturday night, I think. Uh, this is where I'd want to be. <laughs> so once again, uh, we are uh, in the uh, black period, blackout period, um, anticipated loss of communications. We do anticipate to regain those communications around 12.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time or 3.30 a.m. Eastern time. Just after that, as Jesse was saying, we'll uh, see the drogue parachutes deploy about two minutes uh, after, and then 
about two minutes after coming back from the blackout period, we'll see those drogues deploy. And then just a, a minute later, we'll see the main parachutes deploy. So as, as we said earlier, this is a series of events that uh, when you start, it seems like, oh man, it's gonna take a while, but they do happen in rapid succession. Uh, and <laughs> I just noticed there's a, um, a turtle inflatable down in front of Mission Control in celebration oh. of our new <laughs> landing location uh, at uh, Dry Tortugas. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Uh, celebrating our new splashdown yeah. zone, welcoming the Polaris Dawn crew home. <laughs> Um, and we are uh, a little over halfway through that blackout period. We are expecting to hopefully gain comms back uh, in about a couple minutes from now again. Uh, and this, you can see on your screen, is the first ground view of the Dragon capsule making its way back entering the Earth's atmosphere. I love this view. Uh, <laughs> it's a... It's, it's so fun to watch this. I can only imagine what it would be like to watch it with our own eyes. Um, this thermal view uh, in particular is really cool because you can, you can see the trail behind it. Oh, now, that is so awesome. There's well, four humans inside of that capsule yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> now. Once again, we are in the anticipated communications blackout period. Um, basically, there is an envelope of ionized air around the spacecraft and it blocks radio signals from reaching Dragon. So this basically plasma field around it prohibits us from commanding the vehicle or from communicating with the crew. Uh, so this anticipated blackout period lasts about seven minutes. So uh, we should be coming out of it here in about the next minute or so. We will probably start to hear uh, the SpaceX core begin to reach out to the Dragon capsule, uh, just trying to hail them, or we might even hear from uh, the Polariston crew first. Oh, that's an incredible view wow. from the recovery <laughs> ship uh, stationed <laughs> out in the water. That is a sight to see for the people that are watching this live. Uh, yeah. It's not a comet, it is just the Polaris Dawn crew coming back to Earth. Wow, that is an amazing view. <laughs> Once again, we expect this uh, blackout period to end in about a minute. Another view of the... Dragon SpaceX, com check. Dragon has you loud and clear. Help me, SpaceX. Loud and clear, Jared. Expect automated shoot deployment. Incredible views, incredible comms. We have regained communications <laughs> with the Polaris Dawn crew. This is a drone circling the recovery vessel. And that little white dot, I should start, the big white dot on the right, obviously the moon, the little white dot there in the center of your screen is the Dragon Resilience vehicle making its way, its final few kilometers back down to planet Earth after spending five days in orbit. Wow, just some epic views tonight. <laughs> you can hear the crowd here in Hawthorne getting excited. We've confirmed that we have comms with the crew. Dragon SpaceX, GPS converged. Expect nominal altitude for drogue shoot deploy. Copy that, SpaceX. We show the same in tracking. And the crew is still traveling very quickly right now as they're coming back through the Earth's atmosphere. But as you heard, the drogue chutes should be deploying here shortly, and that's going to slow them down significantly. Yeah, we, we expect those to deploy in about 90 seconds. And as we heard in those comms, it's triggered by GPS. So the Dragon capsule using that, um, that, that GPS will automatically know exactly when to deploy it. And that happens around 40 kilometers. Once the drogue parachutes deploy, about a minute after that, we'll see the main parachutes. And it's pretty incredible that we only... Uh... We can see seat rotation now underway. This helps put the crew in a uh, more ergonomic position in anticipation of Brace splashdown. for drogue window. Copy, we're bracing. Should see those chutes deploy here shortly. 
And you can see the crew bracing, <laughs> as instructed, for the change in velocity. Standing by for deployment of the drogue parachutes. These will help bring the vehicle down from about 350 miles per hour when they deploy down to about 119 miles per hour when the main parachutes deploy. There we can see that the <laughs> drogue chutes have successfully deployed. <laughs> it's a great thermal image. And that view is from the actual basin where those drogue parachutes are located. Dragon SpaceX visual on two healthy drogues. Happy that SpaceX, we show the same. <laughs> These drogue parachutes help to stabilize the Dragon capsule and get it into the right orientation before those main parachutes uh, pop out, as well as providing that initial deceleration. This is such a great thermal shot of the, the Dragon capsule. You can see it turning a little bit with the drogue parachutes. And there are the four main chutes now deployed. They'll slowly open up to their full uh, deployment here in just a few seconds. Incredible views of the Polaris Dawn crew returning to Earth after five days <laughs> in Earth's orbit. The crowd here at Mission Control in Hawthorne cheering. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight to see. Copy that space action, you show the same, 1,000. Copy, 1,000. Beautiful sight to see those four healthy main parachutes. So great. Now yeah. in about two minutes, we expect our splashdown to occur. And you may hear the crew and the core talking. They're uh, communicating about their altitude as they make their way back down to Earth. We should start. 800. Yeah, there it is. So we should start to hear an our, eight. our hearing. Uh, our commander, Jared Isaacman, call out the altitude as they descend to the ocean's surface. We can see the Polaris Dawn crew nestled in their seats there on the left-hand side of your screen as they anticipate their splashdown. Copy, six. And you can see the difference in velocity. This is a lot gentler than just a few minutes ago. That Dragon is coming back down to Earth. Absolutely. <laughs> These main parachutes deploy at about 119 miles per hour and help slow the Dragon capsule down to about 15 miles per hour when it makes contact with the ocean. You can also see that the capsule is down. The capsule is now stabilized. It's no longer spinning like we saw it with the drug parachutes. Two hundred, we're bracing. Copy two hundred and brace. Bracing for splashdown. That will be the final call we hear from Jared until contact with the ocean surface. Standing by for a splashdown of the Polaris Dawn crew. And there you can <laughs> see. As you can see on your screen, and by the cheers behind us, the Polaris Dawn crew has successfully splashed down. Welcome back to planet Earth, Polaris Dawn. 
SpaceX recovery team now moving into place to begin the process of strapping the Dragon capsule up with the necessary uh, rigging in order to lift it onto the recovery vessel. Dragon capsule appears to be in a pretty stable uh, position. After SpaceX Dragon vehicle code one, cruise code one. SpaceX copies code one. Now the recovery teams have been ready and waiting about three nautical miles away. So it's gonna take them just about 30 minutes to make their way to Jared, Kid, Sarah, and Anna who are currently inside of the Dragon capsule that you see there on your screen, back here, home on Earth. That call out that we heard earlier, uh, confirmation of what uh, I had said a little bit prior to in terms of that stable configuration, that code one call out, um, is the reflection of the crew's reporting of that of that landing position. We can see the Dragon capsule bobbing in the distance. Like Jesse said, the recovery team is a little ways away from the splashdown location, uh, obviously to ensure their safety, um, as well as the safety of the Polaris Dawn crew. So it takes a little while for the large recovery vessel to make its way over to the Dragon capsule, but there are a couple of fast boats that we will likely see come into screen um, sooner than later. And those fast boats carry- Space Tank Dragon, we're stable one. Those fast boats carry- Copy, stable one. Those fast boats carry the recovery team members that will scoop up the parachutes from the water, <coughs> excuse me, as well as perform the initial safety checks to make sure that there are no hypergolic fuel vapors or um, uh, any, any basically potentially harmful vapors remaining around the Dragon capsule following the deorbit sequence. So we'll see a crew with some personal protective equipment uh, on around the, uh, wearing that personal protective equipment around the capsule performing those safety checks before allowing anyone to get uh, too close to the capsule. And I love that we have those fast boats, you know, instead of waiting for the recovery vessel to make it uh, with crew members on board there, we have the fast boats to get there while the recovery vessel is making its way towards the capsule. And we can do all that work in advance. And they are very fast, as you can <laughs> see. SpaceX, on behalf of the entire team of SpaceX, welcome home. We have pulled go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect, expect personnel alongside in approximately one minute. Happy that SpaceX and uh, Polaris Dawn, we are mission complete. Thanks for all the big help pulling this mission together. Now we did see a jet ski pass by that jet ski has a couple uh, recovery folks on board. They've got the go to do those, uh, you know, gas and hazardous checks to make sure that Dragon uh, is safe for the recovery vessel to approach. Yeah, and this view here is actually from a drone hovering near the Dragon capsule, so it gives you a little bit better perspective of how close the fast boats are. Like I mentioned before, some of them are uh, scouring the water looking for the parachutes that were released after Dragon splashed down. We'll try to retrieve those. Uh, and the, another fast boat will approach and begin those safety checks for any hypergolic vapors. Uh, and yeah, we can see them getting, oh, actually you can kind of see one of those parachutes there floating in the water to the right hand side and then the moon in the distance. What a great view. Some great lighting from the moon at this yeah. light, this uh, night uh, splashdown tonight. 
And I'm pretty sure this is uh, the first time we've had these views on our recovery webcasts. <laughs> so it's pretty cool to see. I love, <laughs> I love that we get this, this view right here <laughs> where we can see the, the lights on inside Dragon Capsule <laughs> through the windows. Almost looks uh, like the eyes of Dragon. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. So the fast boat that is closest to the Dragon capsule, uh, that is the crew that will begin. Yeah, you can see with the stick there, that is basically a hypergolic um, uh, detection device. Uh, and yeah, they will attach to the Dragon capsule to get a little closer. Uh, and we can see that they have respirators on. This helps ensure that if there are any lingering vapors, that uh, they will not be exposed to those. Now the recovery team, just like the Polaris Dawn crew, uh, they perform quite a bit of training in order to be able to perform these activities safely. In fact, at, if for those of you that have never watched our recovery, um, shows before, but there will actually be someone that jumps into the water and begins climbing on Dragon Capsule in order to secure the straps that are necessary to lift the, the Dragon Capsule out of the water. Oh, there's a cool shot there because you can actually see the basin where the main parachutes were located. That's where uh, the, the, oh, here's a thermal view now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that lower, larger basin is where the main parachutes were located. A dragon capsule definitely looks toasty having <laughs> come back through the Earth's atmosphere. A little bit toasty there. It was a little hot coming back. Yeah. <laughs> and again, right now the recovery team is ensuring the safety of the crew, uh, making sure there's no hazardous gases around the vehicle. They're pulling the chutes out of the water which is what that thing is below <laughs> the Dragon Capsule there on the bottom right hand side of your screen. It is not a giant squid. <laughs> I love how there are lights on these boats. Uh, maybe not there, actually I take that back. I don't think it's lights on the boats. I think it's lights with some of... Um, Dragon SpaceX, Hypergolf sweeps and unfired ordnance checks. Nominal rigging in progress, approximately two, five minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for PMC. Happy that two five minutes for capsule lift, and glad all the checkouts are good. All right, great news there, um, letting us know, and we can see that the crew members have uh, basically taken off their respirators, allows them to work a little bit more efficiently. Uh, also heard that the crew will have their Dragon SpaceX for PMC. PMC standing for Private Medical Conference, so this is an opportunity to check in Joe with. SpaceX. I would like to try and do the PMC in 10 minutes, one zero minutes, looking for crew to be okay with that weight. Crew's good, we'll call you if we need to pull it in, but right now one zero minutes seems good. Copy. All right, so that PMC private medical conference, that's just an opportunity for the crew to chat with the flight surgeon check in, make sure everybody's feeling good. So it sounds like the crew is on board to have that occur in 10 minutes. Meanwhile, the recovery teams here on your screen scurrying. Oh, there, we, our first view of the individual <laughs> on top of the capsule. <laughs> uh, yeah, we. <laughs> I have said this in many Splashdown webcasts before. Not enough money in the world to convince me to do that <laughs> job. I have so much admiration and respect for the people that can. Uh, just doing that in dark water <laughs> would be terrifying to me. And I love how efficient and well-trained all of these individuals are. They, you, I, we can see it at, in action here. They, they function as a, a really strong unit altogether. Um, even in, I mean, these waters are pretty calm, but you can see the capsule and the boats kind of moving around. Um, and it's, it's not like they're on land. Yeah. <laughs> and 
Yeah, Kate, I mean, at least they are in, uh, near the Florida Keys. Uh, they've probably got some pretty clear water, even though it is nighttime. Uh, I wouldn't mind, you know, jumping on top of the capsule <laughs> and <laughs> trying to, to rig up the Dragon capsule there. It looks like a pretty fun job, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I nighttime would be a hard no. <laughs> Daytime, maybe. Dragon SpaceX for PMC. Dragon SpaceX. All right, we're actually ready to do a PMC now, so I'm going to be privatizing Dragon to ground. You'll next hear from the ship surgeon. Captain SpaceX. So cool to see this happening live with the various recovery team members working to install the straps and the rigging that is necessary in order to uh, in order to safely lift the Dragon capsule out of the water. Um, I want to give a special shout out to the SpaceX weather team and the recovery <laughs> team for unlocking this location and adding it to uh, our, our sites of availability for Dragon recovery opportunities and, and options because um, as we saw trying to launch this mission um, when we originally when we were... Oh, just kidding. Fake Quindar. <laughs> um, when we were trying to launch this, weather was really problematic and it wasn't just the weather at the launch site, which is what most Dragon people SpaceX, think of. Dragon Ground is no longer privatized. Yeah, the, the weather at the launch site is what most people think of. Um, but when we have a shorter duration, uh, basically free flyer type mission like this, where the Dragon capsule is only in orbit for a few days, not only do we have to look at the immediate weather around the launch site and the weather during the ascent abort uh, phases like we always do, but at the time of launch, we also have to be really confident that there will be good weather in the at least a, hand, a couple of landing locations um, available to us at the time of launch. And there, that wasn't an option for any of our existing sites. And the recovery team and the weather team worked really hard to identify this new location and just look how calm the waters are. Wow. It was perfect for this splashdown today. And yeah, Kate, like for the last few weeks, um, weather, you know, in Florida is, you know, that time it's, of year. it's the hurricane <laughs> season. So it's a little bit tough. Um, and like you said, you know, five days trying to make sure that weather is good from start to finish is really, really difficult with that type of weather there in Florida, where typically, you know, other missions, we've gone, gone to the International Space Station where we can kind of wait out weather if we need to. Um, for a mission like the Free Flyer, like you said, uh, that's a little bit harder. Yeah. We don't have as much cargo space to uh, keep you know, food and supplies um, much longer than the planned duration of the mission. Obviously, there's some um, extra in there in case they did need to stay out in space, but we got some, some excellent weather for this. And a big shout out to Starlink. We've got this view here brought to you by Starlink, and we're now seeing the recovery vessel getting closer and closer to the Dragon capsule. Uh, this is where the Dragon capsule is going to be lifted out of the water onto this recovery vessel. A great shot of the helicopter yeah. pad there on top. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so a helicopter is going to come once the crew is on board, once the capsule is on board, the crew's on board um, and has exited the Dragon capsule. A helicopter is going to come land on the recovery vessel and actually fly the crew back to land. That's a lot faster path than waiting on the recovery vessel to get back to land. Um, and that's important to make sure that the crew is safe, healthy, and they can get into um, 
hopefully get get some sleep maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I did make a note that the crew, um, you know, while they are on orbit, everything is scheduled, including their sleep periods. Uh, and they actually had their wake up call at 6.25 p.m. Pacific time uh, or 9.25 p.m. Eastern time. So it's right now almost 1 a.m. Pacific time. So yeah, they've been awake for a while and they had quite quite, quite a day, uh, <laughs> honestly. And I'm sure that they are most excited to see their families again and also probably pretty excited to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> In a bed. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of floating around. Yeah. Now, if you've recently joined us, uh, unfortunately, you missed um, quite a bit of action already, but we still have a bit to go. Uh, so far, we, as you can see, have had a successful splashdown of the Dragon capsule carrying the Polaris Dawn crew. They splashed down about 12.36 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, unfortunately, I, I uh, was too excited and I didn't catch the exact splashdown time, but I think it was right around then. Um, and that is now uh, the recovery of the cup of the capsule is now underway. This view is um, of the recovery team in one of those fast boats. We can see some of the recovery crew members working to uh, place the straps and the rigging around the capsule that that will be used, <coughs> excuse me, to lift the dragon capsule out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. And uh, from there, the crew members will, will uh, excuse me, the recovery team members will open up the side hatch. And uh, that will be the first breath of fresh air that this crew has had since they lifted off. Uh, let's see, five days ago, oh, man, this week has been such a blur. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was Monday night, I, I think. A Monday night for us, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been quite a few days. And once that, hatch is open we will then bring each crew member out one at a time uh, they will then head up to the medical deck and have uh, an in-person checkout with the flight surgeon uh, or excuse me the, the flight surgeon that is on the ship so the ship surgeon and yeah from there they'll get to get on the helicopter that you mentioned yeah and the uh, flight surgeon will be the first to greet the crew once that hatch is open um, and They'll help the, the recovery team um, and crew will help them exit the Dragon capsule if they need to. Um, and we actually, you know, again, three years ago today, the Inspiration4 crew lifted off and did their three-day mission in space. So we'll get to hear some of their thoughts on what that was like exiting the capsule for the first time coming back down to Earth. It was a really kind of a bittersweet time. Like we knew we had just completed all these different milestones. We had done all that research. Um, and I know Polaris Don, they have so much more research they're going to get through. But we had just gotten down into the water and now we're just sitting there waiting and waiting um, to come out and then go on to the next thing, right? And how do we take this story? How do we take this experience and share it with everybody yeah. that's been experiencing it with us? Which they were, they were, they were watching us the entire time, which I think was amazing. We, we had so many people donate to St. Jude uh, during our flight. Uh, that was one of the most incredible things to learn about. Yeah, later that night after Splashdown, right. when we found out we surpassed our $200 million fundraising goal, I, I remember I just couldn't stop crying. I was just so happy. And I love the fact that, you know, our families heard the sonic boom of us coming home. It's like we announced, here we come. I'm glad they knew that was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but that's my, true. my brother, you know, Hayden is an aerospace engineer. He was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he was so excited to hear that. He knew exactly what it was. And we were the first uh, SpaceX crew to splash down in the Atlantic. So we were yeah. the first crew to cause uh, a sonic boom back over Florida since the, the shuttle shuttles. stopped flying. Yeah, yeah. I know. Such a special moment, you know? And I just remember getting back onto the boat and you know, the, and then working on opening up the side hatch for the first time. And Anil being there to welcome us. Welcome and I just- Welcome home, Earthling. I, yeah, I'll yeah. never forget that. <laughs> and I just, I think about the fact that, you know, Anil is, got to greet us and now he's a NASA astronaut and the fact that Anna gets to go and yes. have that experience. And during all of this, she was with our families. Yes. She was supporting them mm -hmm. and um, all of them were supporting our mission. So Sarah was 
and mission control. Mm -hmm. She was chatting with us for launch and in yeah. space, and you know she had trained us to that point. And then Kid was one of the first faces that we saw back on Earth. He had right. been there every step of the way. Yeah. And, um, with fried chicken. <laughs> with fried chicken. Yeah, I was I was ready for some earth food when I got back. I thought that was funny because you were like fried chicken. I just remember you and you kind of like hanging something? out of our mouths as we were oh, diving. Yeah, the I have, oh, there's this good. photo and um you know I'm still like getting used to gravity again, which we had been there three days. I didn't think it'd be such a readjustment, but I'm laying on the stretcher. I've been eating fried chicken and it's all oh, over you. me. <laughs> and I didn't even sit up. I was like, I don't care. I'm so happy. <laughs> I remember Anil coming in and being like, you know, to get help us get out of our, our suit, and, well, out of our seats, and thinking, I've got this. I've got to be like, mm. you know, this is going to be my, my Phoenix Rising moment coming off of the spacecraft. What were you thinking when you first got up on the land and, well, it was onto the boat, and the camera's there, and you're standing? I, I know. I felt like I wanted to have a good show as well, and but the problem I had was that the boat started rocking. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I'm unsteady, and so I look like this, you know, this kind of elephant who's learning how to walk for the first time. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, I was really really excited to, to be back and to go see everyone and, and share the story. And I felt great. I felt awesome. And I looked at you guys coming out too, and you were just strutting your way on to the, the next section. And, and then Jared, of course, followed behind me. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Jared was last out. He, Jared always let us go first. Yep, yep. ladies first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Love hearing the inspiration <laughs> for uh, <laughs> memories, really, of their own space flight mission. Uh, I, I'm sure that the second time around for Jared will feel a little bit different. He, um, you know, had flown on the Inspiration4 mission, as they were mentioning. And, oh, he, this is a, a, a cool view because we, we, can, we can start to see how close the recovery vessel is to the Dragon capsule. We still have the fast boat there working to install the uh, straps that are required to lift the vehicle into that nest that you see there on your screen. So that arm will actually extend out over the water and that will, is what will lift the dragon capsule up and into that nest there at the end. That nest will then translate to the forward end of the boat, or excuse me, the recovery vessel, and that's where we'll let them hang out while we open up the side hatch. Oh, wow. That is just an incredible view. Some great lights, some clear water. Clear skies, we got the moon. Yeah, <laughs> the moon in the background, and all brought to you by Starlink. <laughs> I loved hearing that uh, Haley's first thing coming out of the capsule was eating fried Dragon chicken. <laughs> SpaceX, be advised, transitioning forward link, com will be unavailable for a little less than five minutes. Copy that, SpaceX. <laughs> Yeah, getting some fried chicken fresh off the Dragon capsule. Um, and also another cool full circle moment with Anil, that is Anna Menon's husband, yeah. uh, was the flight surgeon that greeted the Inspiration4 crew, which is really cool. Um, and now Anna has completed her mission in space. Um, just so cool to to see that full circle moment. Again, I, I can't believe this is all happening on the same day that the Inspiration that launched. Four yeah. <laughs> launched three years ago. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so we can we can start to see the recovery team getting closer to the Dragon capsule, one of the fast boats there in the background, um, as well as the capsule itself coming into view. Um, this arm, or excuse me, this arch, rather, that you see in a perfectly vertical position, that will actually extend out to about 45 degrees or so. Uh, and it will happen quite quickly. Basically, once all of the straps are in place and secure and tight, the uh, that arm will extend. You can see uh, a protective buoy there at the end of the vessel to help make sure that nothing comes into contact with the Dragon capsule. But once those straps are attached and that arm, uh, that, those, that hydraulic arch is extended out, um, it, the Dragon capsule will actually be lifted up and out of the water pretty efficiently and uh, placed into that circular 
basket looking thing or what we, we call it a nest. Uh, and that is basically the, the landing point for the dragon capsule. You can see it has a, a bit of a concave shape to help support the similarly concave shaped uh, uh, heat shield at the bottom of the dragon capsule. And once the dragon capsule is in the dragon nest, it will translate um, and move forward towards the um, front of the boat, actually more towards the middle of the boat, to a platform. Um, as you probably can see on the dragon capsule, the hatch is about in the middle of the dragon capsule. Um, so there is a platform for when they open up that hatch that it is very easy to exit the capsule um, to the platform. Now, while we can't see the crew themselves, they are remaining in their seats and strapped in with their safety harnesses. But at this point in time, they are, they have opened up their visor, <coughs> excuse me, as the dynamic portion of flight has concluded. We do continue to flow some cool nitrox or nitrogen oxygen air mixture in through their suits to help keep them uh, comfortable during this phase. But they are also at this point in time allowed to retrieve uh, their water bottles, which had previously been stored for re-entry. So uh, yeah, they're able to stay cool and hydrated and just hang out and, yeah. uh, and enjoy um, the, the last few minutes within their, their, their home for the last five days. They've done a lot of great work this week, so they get a little bit of time to relax and patiently wait as uh, they wait for that hatch to open and get that first fresh breath of air. Again, just some great views here. This is the recovery vessel with the helipad on top of it. Again, a helicopter is going to uh, land on that pad there, uh, board the crew and take them back to land very quickly, back to their families and friends that'll hopefully be there to, to <laughs> greet them back to Earth. <laughs> I love this drone shot that we have. Uh, first time we've had a view like this for our recovery operations. And it's Dragon SpaceX Com check. Dragon has you bottom clear, honey. Bottom clear, forward link transition complete. All right, we can see the recovery team continuing to pull the dragon capsule a little bit closer. There's still one individual there in the bucket where the main parachutes uh, are stored during flight. You can also see at the top of, uh, basically at the top of what is the side hatch, there's another bucket and that's where the drogue parachutes are located. Dragon SpaceX, rigging complete approximately five minutes until capsule lift. Copy that, five minutes till capsule lift. And again, the core communicating to the crew as they can't see outside of the capsule. So there's a lot of movements going on. There's a lot of sounds that they're going to be hearing. And there you can see the hydraulic lift mechanism lowering into position uh, in preparation for lifting the Dragon capsule out of the water. We'll see the recovery team individual who's there um, placing those attachment straps uh, onto the straps that he's already or, um, uh, uh, basically put around the circumference of the dragon capsule. <laughs> that individual will climb up a little bit higher on the capsule and then jump off <laughs> into the dark water. <laughs> and uh, oh, here's a cool view uh, from a, uh, above the, uh, the, that helicopter pad. Uh, that is where the helicopter will land and take the four crew members back to land. So about five minutes, well, at this point, four minutes until uh, the capsule is lifted out of the water. Dragon SpaceX, brace for capsule lift. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> 
It's probably warm water, Kate. Yeah. You know what? (laughs) Sea creatures love warm water, too, in my head. (laughs) They're not going to hurt you. (laughs) We can see the dragon capsule now coming out of the water. Our first view of that well-loved heat shield at the bottom of the dragon resilience vehicle. Dragon now completely out of the water and will be lowered onto that cradle there. Once the dragon capsule is lowered, we will see the recovery team who are obviously out of the way for safety reasons at this point in time. But once the capsule is um, translated and secured, we'll see them begin to hose it down with fresh water. Uh, As we reuse these capsules, um, we want to try and minimize the effects of corrosion, which of course happen due to salt water. So we will actually begin to see not only that basin where the main parachutes were located, uh, that will get rinsed out as well as the, the overall capsule. The crew is now on the recovery vessel, probably their first moment of a little bit more stability yeah. <laughs> being back on Earth. <laughs> Again, what will happen next is once the dragon capsule is fully seated in the nest uh, and we'll remove all the rigging from the capsule that will then translate that capsule and move it forward to a platform. Dragon SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are completing final checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. Copy that, SpaceX, standing by. All right, great news there. And uh, it looks like actually the estimation for lift was uh, uh, we we completed it two minutes early. So like I said, it's a pretty efficient operation. The recovery team, not only have they performed this on numerous actual uh, human space space flight missions, but also in in rehearsals and, and training procedures of their own. So it looks like the crew members that you see there um, have donned some PPE once again. Um, These are respirators that help to ensure that if there are any lingering hypergolic uh, fumes that they will not be exposed to it. So they are actually installing plugs into uh, the uh, the, basically the, the, the outlet of those Draco thrusters and performing additional uh, hypergolic sniffs to ensure that there are no residual fumes. Once they install all of the necessary Draco plugs, they will continue uh, with a final round of um, detection checks and... Dragon SpaceX, looking for your okay to come on board with cameras. SpaceX Dragon, you're welcome aboard with the cams. SpaceX copies. Recovery team continuing with the installation of those safety plugs to help prevent any uh, um, fumes from the Draco thrusters. <coughs> Our Draco engines utilize hypergolic propellants, and those are toxic to humans, of course, and so we want to ensure the safety of our recovery team, as well as the Polaris Dawn crew. So we're going to close up those thrusters and perform some additional uh, fume checks before allowing anyone to approach 
Oh, our first view inside the capsule <laughs> post splashdown. Got some happy faces, visors up, and then seatbelts on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the classic kid thumbs up. Yes, I love it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I've actually been following along with. <laughs> I've been following along with uh, the procedures that they have on their tablets. They're located on their legs, and it's actually written into <laughs> their procedure to remain seated and restrained, <laughs> just in case if uh, anybody inside was feeling daring. They are they are still required to uh, keep all hands inside uh, the ride at all times. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is actually very important. They have been out in space for five days. Uh, they don't have gravity, you know, forcing their muscles um, to be working the way that we utilize them here on Earth. So it is important that when they do take their first steps that we have uh, some of the crew and the medical team there to support them in case they need any help. Absolutely. Um, Again, it's only been five days. Uh, the Inspiration4 crew did three days and uh, they were able to pretty easily walk out uh, of the capsule, but we'll see how uh, this crew does back on gravity. Yeah. Everyone uh, seems to be pretty calm and collected and just chilling out uh, as they await for the Dragon capsule to be translated. Looks like that should be happening just in, a ne in the next couple, <laughs> excuse me, the next couple minutes um, as the recovery team completes their uh, safety installations and removing some uh, harnessing connections. Uh, that nest that the Dragon capsule is in will move toward the forward end of the vessel where there is basically in, in the, the central part of the, of the vessel there is a, a deck where SpaceX uh, crew members are standing by and as Jesse said will be able to assist the astronauts if necessary, to get out of um, uh, out of the capsule or or egress, as we say. And a cool view here, just looking from behind the seats. On your left hand side is Commander Jared Isaacman, and your right hand side is our pilot Kid Poteet. You can kind of get a feel for the difference in seat position. Uh, in terms of the position that it's in now and the position that it, the seats were in while the crew was still in space. The warning and the 1.21 gigawatts uh, <laughs> s uh, stickers were a little bit closer to us, I, I, I feel like. So it kind of gives you a feel for the amount of rotation in those seats. Pretty cool to be able to see the same displays that the crew um, utilizes while they were in flight. Once again, uh, Dragon Resilience has been successful. Well, first of all, made a it made an on-time splashdown uh, in the. I guess this would be you know in considered in the Florida Keys down near uh, at Dry Tortugas and they had a pretty quick recovery out of the water. Um, they are now on the recovery vessel and standing by for the final preparations uh, performed by the recovery team prior to uh, basically opening that side hatch. Once again, this will be the first time that the Polaris Dawn crew will have fresh air. It'll be fresh, salty, fishy <laughs> air, <laughs> but fresh air nonetheless. <laughs> and there we can see the Dragon capsule now being moved toward the central part of the ship. You can see there, uh, there are some SpaceX crew members also wearing respirators. Once again, as we will perform the final hypergolic um, safety uh, sniffing te tests. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, beginning to spray the Dragon capsule down with fresh water to try and rinse that salt water off of the metallic components.
This is very exciting. We're just a few minutes away. There's still some more procedures that they have to go through in order to open that hatch, but just a few minutes away from hatch opening. And again, the first person that will meet them will be the flight surgeon who will enter the capsule uh, and make sure that the crew is feeling good and ready to exit their seats. For those of you that just have, that have joined just recently, uh, the Dragon capsule carrying the Polaris Dawn crew splashed down just 41 minutes ago at 12.36 a.m. Pacific time, 3.36 a.m. Uh, East Coast time. And here we are uh, 40 minutes later, pretty quick operations by the recovery teams in terms of getting over to where the capsule landed getting uh, the parachutes out of the water and uh, adhering the required straps and ultimately lifting the Dragon capsule up onto the recovery vessel as we just saw a few minutes ago. Right now the recovery team outside of the Dragon capsule, like I said before, spraying down the capsule with some fresh water. Dragon SpaceX, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. All right, good news there. Copy that, SpaceX, we're standing by. Looks like those safety checks were quick and successful as everyone has doffed their respirators. And there you can see officially the hatch is open. I just heard cheering from a distant part of the building. <laughs> I have a feeling that came from the Dragon teams at their computers. That, that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is the uh, the flight surgeon doing initial uh, medical checks, making sure that everybody is feeling good. I have a feeling by his smiling face, he's getting four smiling faces in return. Polariston crew has now officially taken their first breath of earth air <laughs> in the last five days. <laughs> we can see the recovery team in the background um, basically putting up some protective uh, fixtures around the, the side hatch in order to ensure that as the crew egresses and, uh, and, and and gets assisted as they come out of the capsule that they uh, don't hurt the, the, the side hatch seals uh, or themselves. Uh, obviously want to protect the, the individuals as well. And super exciting, we can see that the crew is now prepping the Dragon capsule for the crew egress. And there is, you know, they're gonna be removing their harnesses, um, removing any equipment out of the way to ensure that they are safe to step out of their seats and egress the Dragon capsule. Even the flight surgeon has to be assisted. <laughs> it's some tough maneuvering. <laughs> so we'll start to see the footrests. Um, the recovery team will come in and there <laughs> is our Polaris Dawn crew. Our first live view with the side hatch open, <laughs> fist pumps, thumbs up, 
I'm sure if we had audio, there would be some cheers as well. <laughs> I'm sure the crew is so excited to be home. Mission complete, like they said, after five days of yep. some historic milestones. That smiling face there <laughs> in the side hatch taking pictures, I'm sure that is John Krause, also known as Snap. Uh, he is the, I believe, the content director for the Polaris Dawn program. I'm sure uh, it's an exciting moment to be able to capture, both with video and photo, the smiling faces of the crew members. Now we can see some SpaceX crew members, uh, re recovery team, uh, they'll come in, they will start to remove the footrests at the bottoms of each seat. That will help give a little bit more moving room, uh, or I should say area to, uh, for folks to get in and help the, the, our four Polaris Dawn astronauts get out a little bit easier. And there's a foot rest being removed there, as Kate mentioned. Fun fact about those foot rests, they are uh, custom sized for each astronaut, uh, as well as the armrests. So each armrest and foot rest basically comes in like a small, medium, or large option. And depending on, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, the foot length and the arm length of each individual, they get the appropriate size for their body measurements. Yeah, I mean, that goes with the seats themselves, the suits themselves are all customized to each individual astronaut and crew member. Um, basically, they get a customized version just for themselves yeah. for these <laughs> missions. <laughs> now we can see that... Um, Pardon me, the crew members are now able to undo their safety harnesses, their, their five-point safety straps, and uh, I guess that would be the last step before, <laughs> before uh, being able to get out. Now, it seems as though the first person to come out will be Anna Menon, who is on the far right side as we are looking at it. She is in seat four, yeah. So Anna <laughs> is now making her way with this assisted egress. Mission Specialist Anna Menon. <laughs> there she is. Fellow SpaceXer. <laughs> yes. So happy. <laughs> I love this. So excited. <laughs> Welcome back to Earth, Anna. We heard um, Haley Arsenault, who was one of the mission specialists, and uh, and she for the Inspiration Four mission. Uh, we heard her say that Jared um, always let the ladies go first, and so I have a feeling that Sarah might be the next one to egress here. Yep, we can see her uh, now getting out of her seat. <laughs> she and Anna had the two window seats. SpaceX team assisting her to make sure that she doesn't hit the side hatch in any way. <laughs> <laughs> so much excitement. Our second SpaceXer to fly in space, mission specialist Sarah Gillis back on Earth. <laughs> it's so cool to see her. Now egressing is our pilot 
Kid Poteet. I would bet good money that we're going to see some thumbs up <laughs> <laughs> once Kid exits. It's pretty cool to see that uh, they are coming out, standing up on their own two feet and walking off. Fedex, Dragon, this is the final call. Sign up. <laughs> <laughs> some dance moves <laughs> that's pretty great I think that move should be added to the required choreography for <laughs> human space flight missions you know we have the astronaut lean back when they approach <laughs> their rocket on launch day the uh, kid shuffle I think should be the, the, the next one for, for post egress <laughs> We heard Jared get one last call out on <laughs> the loops before egressing himself. And the final Polaris Dawn crew member egressing Dragon Resilience, Commander Jared Isaacman. <laughs> Our second frequent flyer in Dragon, completing his second mission in space. <laughs> for a second, I thought. <laughs> for, a, for a second, I thought he was saying goodbye to his spacecraft, uh, <laughs> but it turns out he was saying goodbye to the people still in there, <laughs> assisting him with his egress. So uh, incredible to see um, what what a day, what a week, <laughs> what a week. <laughs> And now with our Polaris Dawn crew safely back home on Earth and getting checked out by our medical team, what an incredible and exciting mission this has been. Next up, the crew will actually catch a helicopter flight back to shore where they will rejoin their families. Over the five-day mission, Polaris Dawn set records and marked a few firsts that are critical to SpaceX's long-term plans for making humanity a multi-planetary species. After lifting off on Tuesday, September 10th at 5.23 a.m. Eastern Time from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, Dragon climbed to an apogee of just over 1,408 kilometers, flying further than any Dragon to date and traveling further from Earth than any humans since the end of the Apollo program. Then on September 12th, SpaceX teams and the Polaris Dawn crew successfully conducted the first spacewalk from Dragon, testing our new in-house developed EVA suits and procedures that will be critical for building bases and cities on the moon and Mars. Yeah, and it was so cool to watch that. The crew also performed a number of science and research experiments while in orbit, including 36 research studies and experiments designed to advance both human health on Earth and during long duration, long duration spaceflight. And over the course of the mission, the crew demonstrated Starlink's power to transform the way we communicate with spacecraft and people in low Earth orbit, including that incredible music moment, which uh, I've watched many times and will continue to watch <laughs> even more. Now, our future in space is definitely bright, and it's really exciting to think about where we will be in the not-too-distant future. With all of that, thank you so much for joining us tonight and all week. As always, be sure to check x.com slash SpaceX for updates. I'm Kate Tice. And I'm Jesse Anderson. Thank you to everyone for being with us this week for the Polaris Dawn mission and have an incredible night. <laughs>